So for those listening on the web that couldn't hear that, uh, the, the question was whether anybody had looked at, at you know, what were common metabolites across populations, and uh, Dean Jones said that, that they have identified about 8,000 uh, with, with their platform. Uh, so our, our, our next speaker in the, the session is Peter Dorstein. Uh, so continuing the kind of uh, uh, data analytics side of, of the exposome uh, with a slightly different approach to compound identification, uh, and I'll let him tell you about that. Thank you, and also thank you for having me uh, part of this uh, workshop. Um, what I'm going to highlight is sort of the social infrastructure that we might be able to apply to, uh, to begin annotating molecular information. Um, but I want to bring you back to this particular picture. I think sequencing has really revolutionized uh, at least microbial research from the microbiome standpoint. Um, but, but quickly, when sequencing became possible in high throughput, there was an anomaly that, that became very apparent that for every microbe that you can culture, there are 100 different microbes that are not cultured. And so, in other words, uh, most of the microbiome studies that we know about, um, they take both of these in account, but yet the majority has never been studied before. Um, and so we've learned quite a bit about this. We know, have learned about plant growth. Uh, by looking at these microbes, most of those cannot be studied. We've learned about how foods are processed, how they're made. Um, we, we have studied the impact of microbiome on, on buildings. Um, but even uh, how the microbes impact dissolved organic, organic matter, how they impact humans, and, and even how they impact adult urges. And, and I think one of the promises that, that is coming is that there might be at some point a new Viagra that's being developed on this sort of paradigm. But if you go conversely to, to the molecules, uh, which you can begin to say, uh, well, there's a similar type of no anomaly that takes place in the fact that for every molecule that we can get some sort of chemical identifier for, let's say identification, there's at least 50 unknown uh, molecules that you, can, uh, that you can capture by mass spectrometry. At least in my hand, there's only about 2% that we can do, uh, provide annotations for. And so, again, to, to ma uh, compare this sort of analogy, if we start to look at the environment, again, 98% um, of the molecules we have no information on, 98% of the molecules in our foods we have no information on, 98% of the molecules on the buildings we have no information on, and 98% of the molecules we can detect in these scenarios we have no information on. So, so it's a pretty steep challenge. And so um, uh, what we are trying to do is we really try to develop sort of uh, tools to, to, to uh, well, uh, aid to that challenge of the metabolomics count an an uh, uh, anomaly. And so what I'm going to highlight is, is the, some of the tools that we develop, and then uh, if I have time, I'm going to go into an application of this. And so I think for, for most of us that are doing metabolomics or other uh, omics type uh, scenarios, um, we often feel this way, and, and that we're almost really drowning in data. And for me to illustrate this is if I look at my human map project or my cyanobacteria therapeutic discovery project or my human lung project, there are more than 10 million MSMS spectra that I have. And so how do we deal with this? Well, whenever you deal with big data, with large volumes of data, there's two things you have to think about. First, you have to organize and then visualize it. Because if you can't visualize it, you can't interpret it, you cannot uh, uh, create a hypothesis. And, and mass spectrometry, particularly fragmentation data, it has an inherent organization principle. Because in principle, the, the structure of these molecules dictate how they're going to fall apart. And I think we've heard this quite a bit before uh, from Oliver, from, from, from pretty much everybody, all of the speakers. But that means if you have two related molecules, that the chemistry is going to be so similar that they, in many cases, they're going to have similar fragmentation patterns. And so that by itself you can use as an organizing principle. And so what we came up with is, is basically a similarity scoring function between these spectra that allows sort of a, an offset tolerance so that you can f find related type molecules. And I, I think what you will get is you get these groups of molecules that you can then connect with these edges and then the thickness of the edges we usually use as an attribute that defines how similar based on the scoring function that we've applied. And if you, if, if you think about uh, David, what David Wisham was talking about is that there's a lot of metabolism that takes place. 
Here, this could be a connection of an oxidation, for example, that then forms this group of metabolites that are then related. But of course, we don't have seven spectra. Now we have a, half a millions of spectra. And then you can apply different algorithms to improve the visualization. So what you create is, is a map of chemical space that you were able to fragment by mass spectrometry. So that's what this map represents. There's no inherent biological information, but now you have a group of nodes that are chemically distinct from this group of nodes that are distinct from this uh, group of nodes. And then you can add different uh, attributes to it. You can add the parent mass to it that were fragmented, and so you can have some sort of organization. You can have some biological information. You can have patient A, patient B, or exposome 1, exposome B, if you like. Um, but from my perspective, again, uh, I'm actually trained as a chemist, and, and so I see a lot of chemistry here. So when I zoom here, the, it immediately screams to me is that these molecules are probably related to each other. So here you see a 14 Dalton difference. Well, it's probably a methyl group. If we see a 16 Dalton difference, that's probably a, a, an oxygen. And so if we know thi what this molecule is, we can often begin to propagate many of these annotations. And so if you then have a, uh, a standard MSMS spectra, your library of standard MSMS spectra, these could be MassBank, NIST, HMBD, et cetera, you can begin to populate uh, the, 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 this sort of map of molecular space. And this is really what, you, what most of us do in an untargeted metabolomic experiment, except the only things we report on are these nodes that match everything else we pretty much ignore because we don't know how to deal with it. And so for me, this visualization picture allows you to make some inferences in terms of the chemistry that you were able to detect. And I'm just going to zoom in on, on one molecular family that, that, that you might find uh, down here or one of those here, and just to show you what type of relationships there are. In this case, it, it was a, a bacterial peptide. It's called viscose. And there was a known molecule, so there was a standard available. And next to it was another known molecule that was isolated from a slightly different strain of this particular microbe and then another one, and then we have an unknown molecule. And so you can see how this is being propagated either via changes in amino acid or changes in, in the lipid tail. And so here you have another unknown molecule. And we can literally propagate all these nodes that you see here. And so it really helps to facilitate at least some putative uh, uh, chemical insight in terms of what kind of molecules uh, that are accessible. Now, we wanted to make this sort of infrastructure accessible to the wider community, so we teamed up with Nino Bandera, who's a really a fantastic collaborator in, in computer science, and we, we launched this platform about a year ago. It's called Global Natural Product Social Molecular Networking. It's still not published, but even though it's not published, we have quite a few users already. We have uh, over 4,000 users from 81 countries, and what this is really showing is that the ability to visualize chemical space that can detect by mass spectrometry is really quite powerful for the community. So what does this database, or I should really say it's an analysis infrastructure, uh, what does it contain? Well, it has an upload feature, it has a storage feature, it has a data analysis feature, both uh, I call it dereplication, but you can also call it finding known unknowns. Um, but it also provides you the ability to do molecular networking. And then there's a social feature to it, and I'll get back to that in a little bit, feedback. And then nowadays we even have predictive computing, which I won't have time to go into. But the key feature why people come here is this feature right here. You can do molecular networking with this. This is uh, a single data set from a mattress. We're, we're beginning to launch a project on how mattresses or, or people sleeping on mattresses, how that relates to incidence of asthma, for example. Um, and so we're doing some pilot uh, experiments with, with dust from mattress samples. And here's just the diversity of chemistry that you can detect from a single uh, mattress, for example. And the type of molecules, of course, we have to worry about that this might be a laboratory contaminant. Um, but there's phthalates, uh, sunscreens, and those type of molecules that you can begin to identify, at least based on the MS2 signature and the parent mass ions that are, that are available. In other types of studies, what well, we can very quickly look at uh, are the type of medications different individuals are taking. And I think this goes back to what Oliver was nicely saying is you can't rely on people really telling you uh, what they're taking. No, maybe the mass spectrometer should just tell you what these particular people are on. And this is certainly the case in this particular study 
But not only do we see all the medications that this particular individual was on, we also see uh, mechanisms of metabolism. So azithromycin is deglycosylated. We see um, uh, acetylation of sulfur metaxazole and desulfation of sinotron. So really quickly, using molecular networking and, and really this pattern matching, you can begin to infer some of these type of metabolites from this type of a network. But one of the unique concepts that we're trying to uh, create is that we want to keep data alive. And, and I, th I think, again, uh, Alpha had a very nice example where he has stored a lot of his data and he make, can make cross comparisons to all his data and make higher level inferences about his data. And so what we're doing in this particular infrastructure is that you can upload your entire project. We had about a month ago somebody from Hawaii uploading 16,000 LCMS runs. But you know, you can annotate your data, and uh, as you annotate some information, and you, uh, we're fine with even providing information such as, I think this might be a sugar. What happens behind the scene, uh, every MSMS is compared to every other MSMS in the entire database. And so if somebody's working on, on a data, uh, data set, and it matches to somebody else's data, they will get an email saying, hey, you have a putative new identification. And so a, a really nice example that we had was uh, somebody was studying algal invasion of a coral. It was, a, it was an event to coral bleaching. Well, it ended up matching to somebody who was studying exacerbation in cystic fibrosis patients. And it turns out that they have the same inflammatory response. Uh, in fact, uh, corals have some of the oldest innate in, uh, immune systems around. And that manifests itself in the same type of lipids that are changed in, in these, both of these type of exacerbations. So, so what you really get, if, if this data matches other people's data, you really, they get an email as well. So you get this cross-community learning about the information, about the knowledge that we have of, of that mass spectrometry information. Now the other thing that you can do, let's say uh, you're interested in cyanobacteria projects. You can sign up and subscribe to all the cyanobacteria projects. If you're interested in lung projects, you sign up for all the lung projects, et cetera, et cetera. And so if any new information becomes available, you get an email saying, hey, this is available. And so what form do these emails come to you as? Well, simply these hyperlinks. So you can click on these links and you can, there's a variety of uh, analytics that we provide, but one of those are all the identifications. So here, this was one of the lung projects that, uh, that we're doing in our laboratory. We see a lot of the medications, some of the inflammatory lipids that, that, that are present. So as we see, uh, we launched it initially and released it to the public uh, for where other people could start using it in April uh, 2014. And the average fraction ID has grown threefold. The average unique number of molecules that are identified has grown tenfold. But the total number of spectra has, uh, that have been identified this way has increased uh, 22 fold. Now, one of the challenges, of course, um, you're relying on an automated feedback. And, and I, I think this has been illustrated. Uh, we can't be sure if the information is uh, correct. And, and part of the reason is because we don't have a false discovery rate in metabolomics. Um, nobody has figured out how to do this properly yet. And so how do we overcome this limitation? So what are the problems if you rely on, on this type of automatic feedback? Well, there's a, there's a couple of issues. One, somebody in the community could upload a spectrum and provide the wrong annotation, okay? The other possibility is that somebody says hey, it's a sugar and somebody says later on, oh, I know what this is. This is erythromycin. You need to have that flexibility to be able to update, update it. Now, the other possibility is, is that you have two molecules and both of them have very similar spectra. And so what we have provided within this infrastructure is the ability to simply hit re-annotate and provide the annotations, but we keep a log of all the annotations and also who made the changes and who uploaded it. But that still doesn't tell you about quality. How do you know that identification that you get, that match that you get back uh, through our analysis um, is correct? And quite frankly, we don't know because we don't have a false discovery rate. And so how do we deal with quality? 
well, maybe we can take advantage of the community that we have built up through this infrastructure. And uh, there are lots of social infrastructures that do this quite well, and Yelp is one of those. If I go to a new city, and, and in two days I will be the opening lecture at the ASM meeting, so this is, I'm highlighting New Orleans for that reason. But when I go to a new place and I want to go to a restaurant, I look at Yelp and say, I'm going to go to a restaurant that has a lot of stars and is cheap. I, I'm Dutch after all. Um, so, so, so we thought, why don't we do the same thing? And that's exactly what we did. We introduced a system where the community can rate the feedback. And so we have a one to four star. One star is an incorrect identification. Two stars, not enough information to tell. Three stars, it could be an isomer, could be correct. And then four star is correct. And what, so far, based on the scoring criteria that we've used, of course, anybody can open up their own searches and do the searches on their own, but realize that you're going to find more false uh, or usually get more false discoveries. And every search is remembered. But with the scoring criteria for automatic feedback, we're now at 91% uh, of the community have given it four star ratings. 4% four, uh, 4 have given f uh, three star, 4% two star, and 1% has been deemed incorrect. So I think with the scoring criteria that we provide, we've been doing quite well, but we also miss a lot of identifications that we could make. So at this point, this infrastructure is, is, is accessible through the web, and, and we're literally growing uh, 10 to 20 new users a day. I, I, I've rarely seen anything like this for something that is not yet published or is not even find, uh, searchable by Google. But I'm going to highlight just one example of how we can use this uh, particular tool. Um, but before I do, uh, most of us are very familiar with these kind of spreadsheets. Where you get these identification, you get some sort of score, you get identification, and maybe where the scores came from. Um, but for the majority of life scientists, they, they still won't know what to do with this information. And so we need to make the data more informative. And I've been spending quite a bit of time on making uh, data more informative. And one idea was to maybe, what if we collect data spatially or temporally and provide visualization tools of that information? Because then if you have an identification, you can place it in context directly with possibly other types of information such as sequencing. And so that's exactly what we did, is we took swabs, let's say in this case of an individual, but it could be uh, a population study with zip codes on Google Maps, for example. Um, we did multi-TOF on it and UPLCQ TOF analysis, and then we translated the intensity of the multi-TOF data back onto the maps, and then the area under the curve back onto the maps. And then we do three-dimensional modeling and do visualization, data analysis, and biochemical uh, analysis to validate some of the hypotheses we can ge generate with these particular data sets. So this was actually our very first uh, data set that we were able to create. This is a multi-TOF data set, and we're looking at the M over Z value here. And then blue is low intensity, red is high intensity. And so as we're scanning the M over Z range, what you'll see, it's, you'll see it's sort of flickering. It just tells us that there are different chemical distributions that exist on the skin surface. So here's another one, and this is a male. And if we stop these movies in time, what you will see is you'll see molecules in the belly button, you'll see molecules on the hands, groin area, shoulder area, molecules that are uniformly distributed, and gradients of molecules where you have low concentration of a molecule on the head, high concentration when you go towards the toes. And so if I were a microbe, I would say, oh, where's my niche to occupy? Maybe here or here and not there. And, but, but quite frankly, right now we don't really understand how this controls, let's say, colonization of different microbes. Now the second thing that we did is, is we took a second swab we isolated DNA, and that time, that time Rob Knight was still in Boulder and uh, more recently uh, joined uh, the faculty at UCSD, fortunately. Um, but uh, we sent the DNA to Rob Knight and he took a 16S inventory for us so we can see sort of a picture of the microbial communities that are present. And so then we do three-dimensional modeling with that and do visualization. So now we get distribution of propioni bacteria that are on the face, shoulders, and back area. Uh, Staphylococcus on the bottom of the feet just below the breast of the female, 
as well as around the neck of the female. Now that was an unusual location, but as you'll later see, uh, it turns out that there's a lot of lotion residue that is left behind in this particular region that you can see very distinctly by mass spectrometry. So you, see, you can see the company slogan, use our lotion, grow staphylococcus. Um, but as you, when you have spatial information, now even if you don't know what the molecule is, if you don't have an identification, you can begin to start asking questions. So one of the questions that we wanted to know is, is the majority of the chemistry that we see on the skin, is that driven by the microbes that are present? And so one way to answer this is to calculate the diversity of microbes that are present in relationship to the diversity of molecules that you might be able to find. And so what we did is we calculated the Shannon diversity index and what you'll see is that there's a low diversity of organisms that sit on the head, groin and foot region. And this is true for the female as well. And when we apply the same kind of calculation, uh, or maybe I should first say the way to interpret this is that this, uh, there's essentially this is your desert of the body and then these regions are the Amazon of your body because there's a higher diversity. And so if you do the same calculation for mass spec data, what you'll see is that there's a high diversity of molecules on the foot but low diversity of microbes on the foot. And so there's an no correlation between the diversity of molecules versus diversity of organisms. And so that meant that the majority of the chemistry you see on the skin is probably not microbial driven. Um, in fact, one of the things that we're really beginning to realize is that there's a huge diversity uh, among individuals. If we draw a, a P PCOA plot for, uh, for the 39 individuals that we've looked at, um, none of these individuals will fall onto the same sp space into one of these plots. Um, but there was still this challenge that we had. So right now we have millions of MS and mass spectra. We don't know the molecules ahead of time. We don't know the origins of the molecule. So how do we deal with this? And for us, molecular networking and, and using the GMPS infrastructure was really the answer to this. First thing that we do is for all the MSMS spectra that we are able to collect, we create a molecular network such as this. Then what we did is we collected MSMS data on personal care products that those individuals use. We collected MSMS data on cultured microbes that are typically living on the skin. And we collected MSMS spectra on cultured skin cells and then, of course, we had all the database matches and identified putative peptides. So in one map, you can begin to visualize all the knowledge that you have about the diversity of chemistry that you collected by mass spectrometry. And so this is sort of what this looks like, a map for, for both these individuals that you were just looking at. And I'm just going to pull out a couple of these examples. So here's a nice example where you see a molecule on the head of the male but you don't see it on the female at all. And then when you go to the network, you quickly identify, well, that's, a, uh, that's an MSMS spectra that's also found in this particular beauty product, and this beauty product is Nivea for men. And so this is how quickly you can begin to make these kind of correlations. But there's many other correlations. Uh, of course, we can see lipids. Uh, here's another lipid. There's uh, quite a lot of other different types of surfactants that are commonly found in personal care products and, the, and, and other uh, human or microbial derived type of molecules. But we also see molecules that you find in mosquito lotions. Uh, here's an antiseptic. Here's a sunscreen that you readily see. And so we can actually begin to look at the location of some of these. Here is that location where you also see staphylococcus growth for example. Um, but here, this to me was an interesting one. When we saw this molecule DEET, we talked to the person who this particular match belonged to. And what we found out was that they had not applied this until at least one month before sampling. And recently we tested it again. Six months we still see it on their hands. This is on their hands. You would imagine that would wash uh, off quite readily. Now, where we've traced it to is the transfer from the phone and back to the hand and vice versa. And so 
uh, hopefully, what I've shown you is even though there's this great metabolomics count anom uh, anomaly, and I'd love to see this creeping up to two, three, or even five, but we're never going to solve this entire problem. And so we will need to develop in the same way that the microbiome community has done, that allow us to work with this anomaly and make the data more informative and easier to interpret. And that will maybe tell us how, what, when, where type of questions. Now, of course, I'm, I'm really fortunate to have really good friends and colleagues that I work with. Um, Bandera, uh, he's a talent a computer scientist. Uh, molecular networking um, was uh, actually was a, a leftover for almost from his PhD career, um, but it's been really wonderful to work with him. All the 3D mapping and infrastructure has been built by uh, Theodore Alexandrov initially in my, while well, he was in my laboratory, but it now has an independent laboratory. And then all the sequencing was done in the night lab. And of course, uh, this is the talented group I have the fortunate, uh, fortune to work with. And then uh, I'll take any questions if there's time left, but there's none. Thank you. We do have time for some questions if people want to move to the microphones and ask. Bill Farland, Colorado State Committee member. Um, just a comment. Um, through some of the microbiome work that, that we're doing, people are beginning to move away from the 16S analysis of the communities and looking at functional analyses. And I wonder if you were to reanalyze looking at the functions, if the chemistry might match a little bit better. So I, I think that's a really good question. So I, I devise the function. So if you look at the genome, I uh, separate it into two categories. There are some sort of the primary metabolism that are sort of common molecules that might be encountered. And I think if you can rely on CAG, there's some predictability there. Uh, it's, CAG is not perfect, and there's a lot of holes missing, but, but there are some features that you can predict, and certainly you can detect glu glucose. Now, then you have the specialized metabolism, the, the, the natural products, the, the virulence factors, et cetera, et cetera. Those are much harder to predict. So, so uh, there's a beautiful paper by Fishbach that shows sort of the diversity of, of these gene clusters in sequenced genomes of these specialized factors. Um, and, and it's quite wild how diverse they are. Now, the, 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 there's a field called genome mining, which spends a whole lot of time on trying to predict the exact structure from that genetic signature, and I spend a lot of time in that. In fact, the last seven years, I've spent a lot of time in that. And so far, there's been zero molecules that have has predicted the exact molecule. Now, many of them are close. And that may be enough information. So we've actually developed uh, strategies of peptigenomics, glycogenomics, that takes mass pack signatures and tries to connect it back to the genes that are responsible. And uh, particularly for microbial uh, sequences, you can look at tailing enzymes um, in, in an operon, for example, and they may help you provide that additional structural information that you need. Or sometimes you just get a partial structure information. Uh, we, we actually use this to find the first molecule. We call it, uh, informatically, we call it informatopeptin in, in this kind of a strategy. Now, the other one uh, that we should think about is actually metabolism. They're both either liver or the gut by the microbiome. And there you can start to maybe begin thinking about, okay, there are certain predictable kind of transformations that you might look for. And that we can begin to model. And I think there are some people that are doing some really good strategies in, in this particular arena. And so I think all three of these approaches is going to increase that number from one to two, maybe. <laughs> so, but, but that's maybe very significant. Other questions? Okay. Thanks. So let's uh, once again thank our speakers uh, in this session. And uh, we are remarkably close to on time. Um, so we're going to take a, 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 our planned break. We'll come back at uh, 3.30 uh, for the, the panel discussion for this session. Get some coffee and come back ready to, to have a robust discussion. <laughs>